Conversely, larger athletes engaged in intense training may need to consume five to 10 grams per day of creatine to maintain optimal capacity whole body creatine stores and clinical populations may need to consume 10 to 30 grams per day throughout their lifespan to offset creatine synthesis deficiencies and or provide therapeutic benefit in various disease states. What's up guys, Derek, moreplatesmoredates.com. Today we're gonna to be talking about creatine, the good old natural first stepping stone to supplementation. Muscle growth, you know, back in the day when you're fucking, I don't know, 16, 17, your mom thought this was steroids. You probably thought it was like steroids too at the time. It was, uh, seemed pretty intense. And, um, you know, everyone has nostalgia for their, uh, you know, first loading phase of creatine monohydrate. They bought it, you know, Walmart or whatever it is. And, uh, or even your cell tech, you know, prepare your goddamn anus, like Jay Cutler used to say. Um, not actually, but <laughs> people used to make memes about him saying that with cell tech. Um, there's some pretty fucking funny ads with him promoting cell tech, which is at the end of the day, just a goddamn tub of sugar plus creatine, essentially, sold for whatever it was, like 50 bucks or some shit. And uh, we all bought it. We all spent all our hard earned money on it, as well as shit like Sizon, fucking plasma jet goddamn super pump 250 back in the day which is yeah actually a good pre-workout at the time um but yeah man some of the nostalgia for some of that shit but anyway as far as creatine goes you know there is the you know golden rule of like five grams per day after you've hit your maintenance um but there's been you know supplement companies that have seemed to you know, I often, when I critique labels, I look at the shit and I'm like, why would you not just put in five grams? And then, you know, sometimes you'll have companies that put like two or three in and it's like, well, why are you doing that? And then their justification is often that that's the clinical dose and that's all you need. But at the end of the day, is that really the case for individuals who are actually using creatine? So, you know, most people who are using creatine are men. I'm not trying to be discriminatory or anything. I'm just saying like most people who are trying to gain muscle and like actively supplement with shit for muscle growth are going to be men. You're going to be individuals that weigh upwards of fucking, you know, 1.5 to two times as much as women. In addition to that, their micronutrients and caloric needs are going to differ based on body weight and energy processes, muscle mass, Shit like this is going to change the nutrient requirements that you need for physiologic functions and as well as muscle growth and recovery in an optimal context. So does the same 110 pound chick need the same protein intake to gain muscle as a 220 pound dude? No, of course not, it varies. So saying that three grams is applicable for everyone, including massive bodybuilders or even like, you know, above average guys, to me seems kind of, uh, like a stretch because in fact, you know, perhaps for a lot of people, you're going to saturate, you know, your creatine stores enough to a point where more is not necessarily better. And, um, you know, I get that, you know, for a lot of people, maybe it is sufficient, but at the end of the day, you know, for me personally, the way I approach supplementation and, or, you know, nutrition and whatnot, like I want to make sure I'm at that top end of where I could be getting the max benefit before side effects occur. So what is the um, most effective dose that the ROI is so high that there's like such a minimal amount of side effect potential that it, you know, justifies hitting that, whatever that highest dose is. So like, you know, an example of that, for example, is like if I could choose having a 600 nanogram per deciliter test level versus a 900, you know, I would probably be, you know, inclined to go with the 900 just based on the fact that I know I'd probably build more muscle. Um, and being within a therapeutic reference range, like I feel, feel fairly comfortable that I would still be a healthy individual, given that I'm not essentially going super physiological. So with creatine, you know, obviously not a direct comparison, but I'm just trying to say like, you know, if I knew for a fact I could gain maximum amount of muscle by having, I don't know, let's just say 300 grams of protein per day versus I can probably get maximum muscle, but I'm not really sure, but it probably, because it's a general rule of thumb, if I got in, you know, 220 or some shit, would I go with the 220 when I'm like unsure about what it's gonna do for me? You know, like I'd probably push the envelope given, you know, I have healthy kidneys and whatnot and go closer to the 300 mark. 
With creatine, I see it the same way. You know, I would rather see somebody, or you know, obviously, I would rather see myself or an individual who is, uh, I imagine, like-minded would probably think this way, using whatever the maximum amount of creatine is that your body could potentially utilize without it being problematic in a tolerability side effect aspect. So even if you go to examine.com, you know, the most reputable source for information on individual ingredients probably, and you go down to the dosage outline, you see the outline of a loading protocol followed by 0 0.03 grams per kilogram per day for three weeks or indefinitely for a 180 pound male. This translates to 25 grams per day during the loading phase and two and a half grams afterwards. Although many users take five grams per day due to the low price of creatine, again, low price and the possibility of experiencing increased benefits. Hmm. Increased benefits above two and a half. Interesting. Higher doses up to 10 grams per day may be beneficial for people with a higher amount of muscle mass and high activity levels or for those who are non-responders to the lower five gram per day dose. So is this something that should be considered? Yes. Are you somebody who is a weak responder? Are you somebody who needs more? Are you bigger than the average person? Do you have higher nutrient intake needs than the average individual because of your body mass and or whatever kind of things you're doing in your life that may otherwise justify that? Yeah, it's certainly plausible that you don't get away with, you know, your two and a half to three grams and get your maximum outcome. It's certainly plausible you need at least five, perhaps even upwards of 10, you know, maybe a more niche scenario, but I'm sure it definitely exists. And above and beyond that, there's genetic predispositions when it comes to polymorphisms and whatnot in methylation demands that significantly alter creatine and methyl donor requirements and whatnot in order to stay healthy and functioning full, you know, top top tilt because some individuals have um, no issues in that aspect. And some people have major enzymatic deficiencies that require backfilling with more aggressive supplementation. Here in this, uh, we see in International Society of Sports Nutrition Position Stand Safety and Efficacy of Creatine Supplementation Exercise Sports and Medicine. We can see here, some individuals have been found to have creatine synthesis deficiencies due to inborn errors in AGAT, GMAT, and or creatine transporter deficiencies and therefore must depend on dietary creatine intake in order to maintain normal muscle mass and brain concentrations of phosphocreatine and creatine. So again, keep in mind, this is brain stuff too. It's not just muscle. In addition, it plays a huge impact on even stuff like myostatin, um, things like fertility. Shit like this is all interplayed into creatine and people don't realize it. They just think it's this thing that bloats you up with intramuscular water and helps in the gym a bit. In reality, it has a lot of fucking overlap with a lot of health processes in addition to cognitive enhancement and brain health. Um, conversely, larger athletes, oh, hang on, vegetarians have been reported to have low intramuscular creatine stores and therefore may observe greater gains in muscle creatine content from creatine supplementation. Um, conversely, larger athletes engaged in intense training may need to consume five to 10 grams per day of creatine to maintain optimal capacity whole body creatine stores and clinical populations may need to consume 10 to 30 grams per day throughout their lifespan to offset creatine synthesis deficiencies and or provide therapeutic benefit in various disease states. So again, saying blanket statement, three grams, two and a half grams, whatever it is, is good enough for everyone. Like based on what, you know, based on like a fucking, like it's good enough for a 140 pound chick, you know, like I, I don't, I don't get the general blanket statement. That's like saying, one scoop of whey protein is like good enough for you. It's like, well, how? It's like 25 grams, like maybe that's not enough for me on top of my diet to help me hit what I need for you know maximizing muscle protein synthesis throughout the day. You know, like saying like you definitely think this is enough creatine seems a bit short-sighted to me when there are definitely case-specific scenarios that otherwise would justify a higher dose. Um, for example, so personally, I'm homozygous for C677T of MTHFR, which in layman's terms is basically like a genetic lacking, it's like a genetic fuck up essentially, where you have a shittier functioning enzymatic activity to the point where I have 80 to 90% decrease in my efficiency in processing folic acid. And in addition to that, it places increased burden on my body when it comes to methylation demand. So the direct reflection of that in blood biomarkers can be high homocysteine and low B12 and folate levels. And this is, you know, one of the reasons why uh, so many pregnant women end up having miscarriages with folic acid supplementation, or at least it's hypothesized, 
is individuals that are getting folic acid that have MTHFR polymorphisms, for example, would be individuals who are like hyper, hyper responsive in a bad way to folic acid. So for example, like 45% of your body's uh, methylation demands are used to synthesize creatine endogenously. Now that amount is like, you know, in the couple grams range per day. And, you know, replenishment of it is typically easy to do through diet and just like endogenous, uh, well, not necessarily diet for a lot of people, but endogenous um, production plays a pretty big role. You actually produce about a gram a day endogenously. And while most of that is stored in, uh, you know, like creatine and phosphocreatine stores are mostly stored in skeletal muscle, but the remainder is distributed in the blood, brain, and other tissues. And this is required for other things above and beyond muscle growth. Everyone just looks at intramuscular fullness. How much is it helping your strength? They're off, you know, not thinking about some of the downstream stuff that creatine does and a neurological aspect and potentially a myostatin aspect. You know, this also plays into the muscle growth as well. Fertility, like I mentioned before, like there's a lot of very, very, very potent benefits of adequate creatine intake that often go overlooked because it gets this hype as a muscle builder when in reality, it offers so many things and one of its most notable functions is neurological support. So the endogenous synthesis of creatine relies on a process called methylation. So basically to get into the science a bit, arginine and glycine are combined by an enzyme to form guanidino acetate. And if you don't know, like what I'm, I'm reading off of my own article I wrote for Gorilla Mode and Gorilla Mode Nitric right now, if you wanna see my breakdown of those products and the kind of like charts and shit, I use a lot of graphics in those videos. Um, or the articles, the written formats, you can check that out on moreplatesmoredays.com or watch the Gorilla Mode and Gorilla Mode Nitric breakdowns. They're like an hour and a half breakdowns of each uh, product ingredient by ingredient, where I go into more detail than this. But in general, that's mainly what you need to know. Um, they're combined by an enzyme to form guanidino acetate, which is methylated into creatine. Problem is this is dependent on a mechanism of action commonly inhibited in the general population via endogenous arginine deficiency, glycine deficiency, very fucking common, or MTHFR polymorphism. So this enzyme is needed for the production of DNA and methylation pathways that are essential for all bodily functions. And genetic variations in this gene results in reduced activity of the enzyme and has been associated with cardiovascular disease, neurological defects, some forms of cancer, and a myriad of other diseases and disorders. Um, so circling back to me being 677T of MTHFR, this is an 80 to 90% decrease in efficiency for processing folic acid, can cause high homocysteine, blah, blah, blah. So what do we see reflected in the clinical literature when it comes to creatine supplementation? Well, you can find that one study, this is above and beyond just like, you know, how jacked is a BQ. One study found that supplementing with five grams of creatine per day lowered plasma homocysteine levels by almost 50% in the subject who is homozygous for C6, 7,7-T of MTHFR. So creatine supplementation, not only does it help in a you know, muscle aspect, a, you know, cosmetically appealing muscle fullness aspect, um, it can significantly lower the body's demands for methylation and prevent the depletion of methyl groups. So this is pretty critical for somebody who has a um, polymorphism like myself. Um, and this is why I personally supplement with five grams of creatine per day. So, you know, as far as how much of a dose you need, again, it's going to depend on the individual. I do not think that five grams even is a blanket statement for everyone. Rather, it is a dose that will probably cover the vast majority of individuals needs though, where above and beyond that, you know, how much is it helping? Is it causing more stress? You know, this is an individually assessed thing at the end of the day, you'd have to kind of figure out on your own. It's pretty easy through metabolic parameters and blood work as well as how you feel and whatnot. But yeah, at the end of the day, this is something that is not a blanket statement. Three grams is not going to be adequate for every single individual just based on some arbitrary, you know, guideline does not factor in lean muscle mass, does not factor in sports, does not factor in exercise, does not factor in um, genetic differentiation. None of this shit is factored in when that blanket statement is made. So for a lot of indiv individuals, or I imagine a lot would benefit more from five grams. And then above and beyond that, I'm sure there are niche scenarios where individuals need upwards of 10 grams just based on sheer fucking body mass alone. And above and beyond that, for people who have deficiencies like myself, enzymatic processes, yeah, you probably need more even above and beyond that, just not even being, you know, weighing a lot. You just have a fucking huge problem in that your methylation demands are so disproportionately 
dysregulated compared to the average person that's supplementing with things like betaine, with things like choline, with things like creatine. Obviously, like this is all stuff that is going to relieve burden off your system when it is otherwise unable to achieve these through endogenous processes and you were certainly not getting it through your diet unless you have a really dialed in diet then that's great but most individuals are not and probably need that supplementation so definitely want to get on creatine in my opinion as a natural or even an enhanced guy if you haven't it does make a significant difference on performance as well as hypertrophy and strength and and hopefully you enjoyed that hopefully it might have opened your eyes up a bit to the possibility that you know, like logically, if you think about it, does the nutrient intake needs of a 250 pound bodybuilder equate to the same nutrient intake needs of a 100 pound little chick? No, they don't. So why would two to three grams of creatine be sufficient for every single person? It simply would not be. Your needs are going to escalate based on how much you can store, how much is going to be beneficial for you proportionally to your body weight, as well as your genetic predispositions as well as your diet model and shit like that. But at the end of the day, I think five grams is a pretty safe dose that covers most people. And then above and beyond that, there are some niche scenarios where individuals will need to go higher. But I think when I see things like two and a half to three grams, I'm like, like just put in the five, bro. You know, that is my stance. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. All the comments help the algorithm. They're much appreciated. Like, subscribe, check out my blog, replacemoreandates.com, follow me on Instagram. At replacemoreandates, Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts, if you wanna support the channel. Check out Gorilla Mind, nootropic formulas, Gorilla Mode, a pre-workout formula designed myself from scratch, has the five gram creatine monohydrate dose in each um, full daily uh, dose of each product. And anything else I'm associated with, it's all in the video description below. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.